just like all, you know, little girls, um, I loved singing and dancing and my parents enrolled me into, you know, a local little school. This is really how I got into it professionally. We had a neighbor who had um, signed with a local manager. So once my mom heard that, my mom was like the ultimate stage mother. And as soon as she heard that someone was doing it professionally, she was like, let's try, let's try. I was the stage mom from when she was three years old. I took her everywhere to New York City. She had the best of lessons and Felissa fit right in. And it was she and I, the stage mother and my talented daughter, Felissa. I got involved with acting uh, sort of on a lark. Uh, the uh, BBDNO um, advertising company came to my high school to do a commercial. It ended up being a Pepsi commercial with uh, Gabriel Kaplan, who played Mr. Cotter and Welcome Back Cotter, and he was a hero of mine. At the very last minute, literally with five minutes to sign up, uh, two friends of mine dragged me into the principal's office, which was the last place I ever wanted to go. And long story short, I got it at the end when the whole high school auditioned. He looked at my mother and he said, you know, your kid's natural. And I looked at her and said, can I get an agent? I first heard about Sleepaway Camp um, through this local manager that my friends were signed with. Uh, you know, it was like it was the late 70s, early 80s. So if you remember that time, it was like everybody was really like blonde and light and Christy Brinkley and Cheryl Teagues. So when the manager met me, they were this like, you know, Long Island, New York management. All right, Daw, look, you're very ethnic. I'd never heard the word ethnic before, so we were like, oh, okay. I'll send you out on three auditions. A Tide commercial, an audition for an off-Broadway show called Really Rosie, and a horror movie called Sleepaway Camp. The genesis of Sleepaway Camp really was, I was in film school at NYU, and I wanted to make a movie. It occurred to me that the most commercial form of film at the time, the easiest film to uh, type of film to sell, would be a horror film. I figured one location, budget would be pretty modest, which was a camp, of course, and then uh, needed a kick-ass ending. I'd never seen a movie that depicted camp realistically before. And so when I read it, that's, that was my first um, response was I, I said, wow, this really, it reads like camp. In a camp setting, kids are free to be kids. You know, they're, they're not bound by the, the normal rules of, uh, adult them when they're home or when they're in school. In camp, you know, who's watching over them? Uh, you know, teenagers. I went to sleep boy camp when I was a kid, so I had experienced it. The isolation, the sort of Lord of the Flies uh, dynamic. At nine, I think my parents sent me to sleep boy camp and I hated it. Um, I hated it. I just hated it. I used to send my parents letters threatening that I was going to run away from camp. I was going to just leave, walk away. Horror movies at the time were using um, actors that are 18, 19, 20 years old to play 13, 14 year olds. I wanted to take 13, 14 year olds and have kids play kids. They wanted a wide eyed, flat chested little girl. And I met Robert Hiltzik. And I sat there and the first thing he asked me was, you know, pretend that you're eating a candy bar without saying anything. And he wanted my eyes really intense, like just focused on one thing. He told me to first describe my town of Maplewood, New Jersey as if I were a newscaster uh, and, you know, or someone trying to sell the town. And uh, I think that's apropos of the scene where I'm talking to Mozart. Shut up, Mozart! And then uh, he, he asked me to tell him off. And I looked at him and I said, really? And I absolutely let him have it. I knew when I walked out that, I, that it was mine. Um, I had an agent at the time when I went uh, to an audition downtown at NYU, which is where Robert went to school. It was an improv and he just said, uh, there's no script. Okay, you're at camp and you hate this girl and she's sitting over there and just go at it. In his unorthodox way of how we auditioned, how I auditioned for him. He asked me to break up a make-believe fight. Not everyone had gotten the script. He gave most of the people sides, but for some reason or other, he had given me the script to read. I saw that Ronnie still survived, so I thought it was pretty cool. He called me immediately to tell me the next day, man, you got the role. I was approached by Bill Billowit, who was the art director. He was the one that approached me about doing it, and we sat down, and I think he was sizing me up, and uh, then, 
I met with Bob Hiltzik. Here's a horror movie, and your daughter will, you know, be playing this serial killer. Um, is that okay? And, and all this, and my mom being the stage manager, the stage mother was like, yeah, of course, oh my God, yeah, in a movie? Did she get the part? I went to the agent's office, I read the entire script, and there were things that we did negotiate. The, with the killing of the hands, using my hands as the killer was a big red flag for my mom. And it wasn't about my hands, it was about, I'd have to actually be involved in that, you know, moment of stabbing Meg in the shower or sticking that curling iron up the bitch's vagina. <laughs> or, you know, throwing the boiling water. I mean, you certainly don't want your 13-year-old little, petite, sweet, bubbly, happy girl like running around camp like a lunatic. The penis? No problem. <laughs> That's good. This, it was the callback that Robert and Missy, his now wife, um, she was the producer, had to speak with my mom about the ending. Early on, there was talk of another way of handling this, something that no one knows about and it was called a strap-on. <laughs> and Felissa was never going to be allowed to strap that on. At one point, I was up in the shop uh, sculpting a male genital. Uh, uh, there was some talk about, you know, actually making her up with a penis on her. Uh, I think when I started doing that, and people saw the reality of that in clay sitting on my workshop bench, they, they thought this, re rethought this again. There were no discussions, nor was it ever talked about, thought about, communicated, this whole homosexuality, pedophilia. Switching genders in the minds of children, which, oh, I have goose pimples just saying that. I mean, it's, it's extraordinary. So, oh my gosh, we didn't know about it at the time. There was no way to know about it. Robert didn't want it to get out. Well, you know, we pushed the envelope a little bit. Um, a crying game riff off. Uh, but, um, you know, it was, I didn't want to just do a standard film. My dad had just opened a place called Motel on the Mountain, which was like a big gay resort. So my pedigree in my family is that we love people. We don't, you know, we're open to everything. In those days, uh, you know, effects are what drove a lot of films. We wanted to do some different things, of course, and working with Ed French and Ed Fountain, uh, tremendous. These guys are extremely creative. Bill Billowit uh, was enormously influential. He'd gone to Bob and actually made some very crude but effective uh, stick figure sketches of w the way the effects should be filmed. Then when I met with Bob, I sat down and flesh them out a little bit more in terms of what he was he was going for. We went to Ed French's apartment in New York City. She was just a kid, I mean, just a, just a little kid, and Mom was there, you know, like overseeing it to make sure the mad scientist wasn't gonna, gonna kill her or something. Put a mold on me now, I cry bloody murder. I'm like, get this sleeping off me, it's terrible. You can't breathe, it's over your face. Um, and the mold had to be of that face, because that's what he has at the end of the movie. So I sat with him all for however long, and that was the experience. In the case of her mask, I couldn't make it in gelatin, and I couldn't make it in rubber. If somebody wore it, it would deform. So we knew that whoever was gonna wear it would sort of have to be behind it. It's a potato chip thin mask made of dental acrylic that's tinted pink and translucent. The glass eyeballs came from uh, a company uh, in New York that I discovered that does that did taxidermy. And I found some eyes that matched her perfectly, glass eyes. They look incredibly realistic on film. Glens Falls is a unique small town with just kind of that strip mall of the laundromat, the movie theater, the motel and I think maybe a bar. We stayed at the Glens Falls Motor Court, which the Grateful Dead had stayed at like a week before, so that was a big deal for me. I was, I was always making jokes, jokes about jumping in the pool and, uh, you know, and then starting to trip. 
And there was a big welcome sign on the hotel marquee. And all the kids knew each other and everyone was just really welcoming and really um, looked like a party was going on and I was welcome to it. The local uh, authorities were pretty comfortable with what we were doing. I don't know if they knew any details about the story, but they uh, were very cooperative. They let us use some of their police cars and ambulances. And I think they loved it. I think they wrote an article about like new horror movie comes to Glens Falls. So they were very welcoming. I wanted to shoot at the camp I attended because I knew the camp so well. And as I was writing the script, the script was kind of developed around that, that setting. You have the boys bunks down the hill, the girls up the hill, the rec hall, the athletic fields, plus the, a beautiful lake. It's, it's the quintessential sleepaway camp setting. The parents were not even on the set which was something that kind of amazed me. The parents basically brought their kids up and disappeared. Most of them were on their own. I don't recall any other parent being there other than my mom. I was like the den mother to all those campers who were there without parents. And I was the, the mom on site. She was really, really cool. She wanted me to experience it fully. We're at camp, this is fun. Like, I just knew it was gonna be a big party. <laughs> well, like, uh... All other movie sets, uh, their relationships would spawn. My first impression of Jonathan Tierston was that he was hot, you know. I thought he was really, really cute, and I wanted to go out with him. You know, and the only thing I remember initially was seeing Felissa and going, my God, she is gorgeous. You know, I was just hitting puberty. I had just turned 13, so I was a young 13. Even then, he was a bad boy, because he was always brooding in the corner. He wasn't, like, Chris Calais who was, Chris Collet, you know. But Johnny at that time was very like, yeah. You know, and, and to me that was like, ah, James Dean. Yeah. She acted much older than she was. Comparatively to the way she looked in Sleepaway Camp, you have to understand she was, I mean, in real life she was wearing makeup and she had earrings on and, um, you know, she was just uh, already turning into a very beautiful woman. From the motel, to the camp, it was a 30 minute drive. So we would be in our little production van and I believe I was sitting in the back and he was in the front and I swear to God, I remember writing a note. Um, I like Jonathan, what do you think? And I passed it to Allison Mord, who was the pretty blonde in the boat. So she was my BFF and she's like, oh my God, let me ask him. So she like tapped him, he was in the front. So what do you think of this? She likes <laughs> And then she was like, oh my God, I <laughs> And so it began. So. And, you know, we hit it off immediately, but there was also a, you know, a, a mutual attraction that happened really quickly. Crazy shit happens at camp. When you're all locked into that remote little area, it's like what happens at camp stays at camp. We had to wait for the, uh, the camp to close. And camps usually went to um, end of August, beginning of September. I remember feeling like I had walked into a memory because it was very eerie to step back to, into a sleepaway camp because they're all so similar. You know, it was great. It was, you know, the cabins and the little bunk beds and we all ate in the actual and disgusting rec hall with the hanging strips with thousands of flies all over them. Paul, oh, great to see you. Good dinner. Ah, uh, you know, same old shit. Chris Collet had a way of making, it was funny because he was younger than I was, but he had a way of really calming me down. He was very New York City and very worldly uh, and exceptionally intelligent. He befriended me right from the get, just like it was in, in the movie. And he really had a way of sort of keeping me. The camaraderie amongst the girls was amazing. She was one of the youngest and she was very social with all the boys and girls and she was very happy camper. <laughs> we all got along unbelievably well. I was a huge fan of Kathy Kami because I was a fan of all my children. So when they said, oh, and the girl who's playing the lead counselor is Kathy Kami from All My Children, I was like, Pamela Kingsley? The name is Meg, M-E-G. I remember the day she arrived, ABC sent her in a big black stretch limo. And they were like, she's on her way, she's on her way. I remember standing by the path, the road, like, <laughs> and you know, I probably jumped all over the girl when she got there. What are you looking at? I was the last one on set. 
So I guess I just knew I was playing somebody obnoxious and that sounded fun to me. I loved Karen Fields. Her character was portrayed so perfectly. I just felt at ease, like I could just be as nasty as I wanted to be, you know, and not think that that was a bad thing to be, because it's fun to be nasty. But she was the complete antithesis of Judy. She was sweet, she was smart, she was loving. They were both like my sisters. Hurry, sweeties, we don't want to be late for the boss. The scene with Aunt Martha in, in uh, Aunt Martha's home with Desiree Gould, that was the first day we shot. And, you know, Desiree is one of those people who you immediately love. Desiree walks in and, ah! you know, and I'm like, and I'm like, oh my God, what am I doing here? You know, I don't know if Aunt Martha was really described. It was just, she was wacky. Why, of course, I believe there's a whole bag. The words were just weird. And actually at one point, and Robert will remember this, I said, I can't do this role because the lines are so slanted. Goodness, no, well, that wouldn't do at all. And I said, you'll have to get someone else. And I didn't expect his response, but it was, I'm not getting anyone else. You're going to do this role if I have to mime the words to you. And I, I just thought it was absolutely fantastic. You know, I wanted to be cool. I wanted to be the cool girl. They wanted no me. You know, even though I was 13, I was still like wearing lip gloss and eyeliner. It was the 80s, baby. <laughs> they wanted, you know, that straight hair with, I had little barrettes that said Angela, and I was like, oh. Am I playing a geek? I'm like, I can't, this is awful. I am, I don't know what I'm doing. All right, maybe when they, maybe when it's my turn to say something, I'll just say it and that's sort of what, so that, that first day was sort of like a blur. They got along like two peas in a pod and it, it was wonderful. Just, just adorable kids talking and chatting and they played off each other beautifully. We all had to wear those little shorts and the camp shirt and I had a special bra made for me my little bosoms, you know. It was this tan colored, stretchy, almost like duct tape. It was sort of uh, show up, put on the short shorts and hope for the best. Come children, let's be on our way. Robert is the type of director who, once you're on the set, is really focused on what should happen in the scene and what your motivation is. And especially with me, it was because she doesn't say anything for most of the movie, but it was really important, he felt, for me to convey with my eyes just how much she was going through. And I thought, you could go fuck yourself if you think you're gonna pick on me. I've never been able to read Robert. He plays his cards very close to his vest with everything he does. And he sometimes has a hard time sort of getting the point across as to what he's actually asking for you. So he mimics it, which doesn't help you that much as an actor, as you might imagine. He just was very clear about, just go for it, and if you need to be reeled back, I will pull you back if you're overacting. Look, he's running the shit. He's writing, directing, producing, and he was young. I mean, I think he's only like 10 years older than I am. In the end result, I think he knew exactly what he wanted to paint on the canvas, and he got it. I remember shooting with Owen, who was a dynamite person. I still got a couple minutes to go. A quiet, loving, sweet man. You could always find Owen somewhere reading a book in a corner. He was an intellect. He was a serious actor. Um, and he portrayed that character really well. Really creepy. Well, hello there, Angela. When we're doing some of the scenes with him, they'd have to cut because I would just, he was so close in my face. So my natural reaction was to just burst out. And, and he was laughing and so it was very light. Awful. Uh, one for the creepiness aspect of it because Owen was very good at being creepy. And two was the slamming against the wood beams on the walk-in. And I think Robert just loved it because he was laughing, he was giggling. And Owen was, you know, no stunt coordinator, nothing. He is flinging me against it, and he must have done it like 15 times. And when we're in the refrigerator, you know, when I see the film, it's like, whoa, because here's this little girl and here's this man undoing his pants. They reverse the shot, so when you're filming, I'm, they're just filming me with my reaction, and then they filmed him and I wasn't there. So it wasn't 
you know, an odd moment between he and I because I didn't see anything. But guess who came to my rescue? <laughs> Good old Ricky. Hey, what are you doing? And rose on my back oh, uh, with redness. And, uh, you know, I just remember Robert keeps saying, Robert saying, again, again. <laughs> he's, he's just snickering. And I'm like, oh my God. What do you want? Well? Jonathan Tiersten loves being the hands. I didn't know about it till I got there. I don't know if Robert knew it till I got there. I think he saw Felissa's hands and realized that they were too feminine. I was the hands of the killer. I'm the ki I'm the hands. Look at my hands. I got manly hands. I got a vein in my hand. I got. I ended up doing all the killing scenes. Okay, my hair kind of looked like Felissa's from the back. You know, I liked it because um, filmmaking can be extremely boring, and there's a lot of waiting around and doing nothing. You know, in the silhouette, he had to wear a wig. It's so obvious that it's me. It just made twice as much work, which I was totally happy for. Where I come from, we call them baldies. One of the things we were trying to do in a film is justify um, why people face the demises that they did. Artie is a, he's, he's a dirty guy. And, you know, we, we want to push that a little bit. Again, we've got young boys and girls in the camp. That's his character. And that's why he reaches the uh, demise that he does. And uh, I like the idea of the, the boiling water because the aftermath allows us to uh, have some fun with the makeup. I remember thinking, my God, how long is it gonna take to pull out the freaking stool? Um, you know, God, I'm like, I'm like <laughs> I thought it was so cool the way they rigged him up. It was complicated because we actually had blisters on the guy's face. I don't know, you, you can sort of see them in the movie that sort of rise, maybe fall, which is a little weird, but I ended up applying uh, gelatin in a liquid form over his face, which looks more realistic on film, looks more like scalded flesh. He was on this special platform they created. We weren't shooting in the actual kitchen. The tubes just wound up behind his head. I needed some place for them to go and he couldn't lay on top of them. So they, they went behind him and through the floor. And uh, it was basically just air. And there was some smoke pumped too through it. Jesus, pain must be incredible. Mind Over Matter was this incredibly long speech he had. Concentrate on summoning all your strength for this single sit-up, and you'll be amazed when the time comes. That was supposed to be much longer, Mind Over Matter. It just went on and on. It was like a page. So he cut a whole bunch of it. I think that's what makes Ricky a really likable character. You know, even though he's picking on Mozart, he doesn't ostracize Mozart. I got five bucks riding on you guys, so don't lose. No sweat, Gene. We're going to kick their ass. Uh, you better. I've seen reviewers over and over talk about how they hate the soft pulse and it just goes on and on and on. Eat shit and die, Ricky. Eat shit and live, Bill. It's camp, guys. That's camp. There was something that Robert loved about that aspect to make it that long. So we loved it because it was, you know, a chance to sort of be out on a ball field. John Dunn and Tom Van Dell, they cracked me up. And she is fucked up. Yo, Angela. What's the matter? Yo, why are you so fucked up? I think that was probably the most fun scene I did through in the whole movie because it was always like I was in on the joke and laughing and having a good time. It was so big. It wouldn't even stay on my head, so I had to keep my head like had to keep my head steady. And I remember looking at Eileen, the, the um, wardrobe lady, and I was like, oh, do I really have to wear this thing? She's like, oh yes, Robert says you have to wear it. And I'm like, oh yeah. What did I do about it, asshole? <sighs> uh, I was so embarrassed with that hat. That cheap son of I did a life cast on uh, John Dunn, and uh, th that, was, uh, that effect was slightly cursed. Hey, when he Bobby came in for the life Bobby. cast that day, uh, I think he was a little nervous. The life cast was a little compromised. I ended up fixing this thing and working on it and retooling it and praying that, you know, nothing would happen to it, it would melt anymore or anything. And, we, you know, we brought it up to the camp and got it into the boat. I mean, the only excuse for doing it, obviously, was the snake came out of the mouth. Did that. There's two kisses. Like he does one by the cabin where it's like, and that was fine because it was just a little. 
But the one on the beach where we're chasing each other and everything, and then he throws me down, was like a big makeout kiss. I remember very clearly being terrified because, you know, it's not only like you're kissing and you're a young girl and you're not really quite sure of yourself and that's an awkward time being like 13 and kissing a boy, but it's on film. I remember going from like person to person. How do you think we're supposed to kiss? Are we supposed to kiss like this? Are we supposed to kiss like this? I think finally the person I went to was Chris and he was the sweetest person. They said, you know, I'm feeling a little like nervous and awkward about this, this kiss. When we got to the set, I was terrified and Chris made everything better. In the original script, it said he undoes my blouse and like feels my chest, which I still to this day think is weird because um, I'm not really a girl, so I'm unsure how that was gonna play out. Do you have to kiss so wet? We were at, uh, in the um, bunk, and Robert said, okay, just kiss until I say cut. And we were dying because he didn't say cut. He finally said, that is the longest kiss I've ever seen anyone. And we were both like, well, because you didn't say cut. Insects intrigue me. When I was at camp, you know, there, there were beehives and wasp nests all over the place. And I thought that trapping somebody in a situation where being attacked by bees could be visually compelling. There's no bees in that hive. <laughs> you can see that on camera and there's no CGI. But everybody, you know, it's the power of suggestion. We don't see, actually get to see the attack because, you know, we only had $335,000. But we, we, we had enough where we could see the aftermath. There was some talk of having the hand be somebody's hand in there, but nobody wanted to be the hand in that thing with the bees. So I wound up using a plaster hand. But a whole bunch of them died because it was, you know, it was really cold up there, so they had to get more bees, I remember that. That section of the set was completely isolated from everything else, and the bees, a beehive was released in there. And I'm not sure what we covered that head with, but, you know, they went for it big time. You know, we can never duplicate a psycho shower scene, but, you know, I guess, uh, I guess we were paying homage uh, to that scene. And what I like about the, the showers in a camp, they're not very sturdy. You know, it's this thin aluminum. And I like the idea of a knife not only going through the person, but sc screeching down that aluminum wall. It's very hard to cut through the material they put up for the uh, shower door. And also, why was I cleaning off the knife and not doing a very good job of it either? The slash down her back was an out of kit effect. It was, it was wax. It was sculpted right on the spot. I can recall saying, well, should we have some more blood stains or whatever? No, no, you know. It all rinsed away, there's no blood. Didn't have to be. It did the job. I was usually in school when they were off, you know, killing and doing the other stuff. And they, and my mom was so on hand. I mean, she really wasn't looking for me to watch the knife going down Meg's back. Judy and the curling iron was kind of inspired by uh, Michelle's sister. And that spawned an idea in my head. He wasn't going to do something that was a complete gross-out movie. He was going to leave a little bit to the imagination. And whenever he could do that, he would. How are we going to take care of Judy, given how evil and nasty she is? And uh, I thought that was a pretty appropriate way for her to go. Getting the arrow through the neck, that was kind of a challenge. I want to see this arrow go into this guy's neck. I want to believe it. I don't want to cut away and I don't want a lot of blood. There's actually a mechanical effect where that all happens in one shot. And I tell you how it was done, but then I have to kill you. The way it works is there's a string. The string sets the mechanism that pops the second half of the arrow up off his back. Mike had some trepidations about doing it. We, we set up a demo of, uh, of it to show him. I think we just, we didn't do the whole makeup, but we put this rig on somebody and showed him how it worked. And it's, you know, it's on screen for two seconds, as you know, but it has an enormous effect. If I have one regret in the film, it's the scene with the little kids. Uh, that really didn't play out the way it was supposed to. 
If I had the chance to do it again, I would probably do something different. Even for a film like this, it seems a little extreme. Um, and it, it's the one part of the film that I'm kind of uncomfortable with. Of course, I get a lot of comments about Frank the Cop and his uh, mustache change. We shot the film and then I needed him back to do the night scenes. And he had gotten a role in something else and he had to shave the mustache. And he didn't have time to regrow it, so we kind of uh, Groucho marked him. I guess we didn't do such a, a great job. And the entire cast and crew revolved around Angela and Ricky. There was a time that there was friction between them. The extras came up from New York and I was a 17 year old kid, I, you know. I got a little crazy and I was probably a little more than frustrated because Felissa was so young and so there were things that I knew we couldn't do. And, and uh, she, you know, saw the, the goings on of when the extras were there and she was just furious and her mom was furious and everybody was mad. You know, I was too young to do anything, like, physically. I remember we would kiss, and that was like, you know, and we had a crush on each other, but, oh, but then they brought in the SAG extra girls who were, like, hot to trot. Oh, I remember this very clearly. There was one really pretty, like, dark one, like, you know, dark hair, dark eyes, and, and Jonathan was like, you know, all about her, and she was probably, like, 19, so I couldn't compete with, like, a buxom, you know, hot actress. Robert halted production and locked us in a room. He said, you two figure it out. Robert had to take us bowling to make sure we were okay. <laughs> it's our history. <laughs> Ricky and Angela had some drama, but uh, we were able to work that out. Meet me at the waterfront after the social. I'll be there. It was a cold night, and, um, you know, we had an actor there in the Angela mask. It was kind of nerve-wracking for, the, for the, uh, the actor with the mask. I just remember my mom being very... That, because they, they shot it separately. My night and the gentleman who was wearing, you know, whose penis, who was wearing the penis, the man who whose penis is the, you know, the star of the film. They were very good about making sure I didn't see much. Like, I'm just sitting there and it's him. And it was all kind of in play and fun and light and everybody laughing. But it was, it was clear to me that it was an intense moment. And it was clear to me that this was going to be shocking. They had this uh, local college kid who they shaved him from head to toe. I think they paid him a couple hundred bucks and then they they let him drink. So this guy sat down and was, you know, sitting there in his bathing suit, basically. That's all he had on, the blanket over in a corner, and started to have a few beers. And by the time it was time to shoot... He was crying horribly. Yeah, it was really just it was bizarre. And it was freezing, because we were by the water. And um, Yeah, so they shaved him, you know, and then they put that Angela mask on him. To be nude and to wear the mask of a little girl has to be strange. And I think that if we'd used, uh, you know, uh, a prosthetic genital instead of that, I don't think it would have been as effective. He's never come out publicly, but never to be seen or heard from again. I believe my final day was my final scene at the end. Um, and it was sad. I remember I didn't want it to end. Wistful, sad. I felt like I was, like I had ended something that was really important. And, uh, but, you know, a sense of accomplishment too. You know, we were all uh, very nervous as to what the rating board was gonna come back with. Actually, I was concerned that I was gonna get an X rating. The sensibilities were different back then. So I get a call from the ratings board and they say, you know, I'm, I'm, you know, we have some bad news. I said, really, you know, what's the news? Well, we're gonna have to give you an R rating. I said, okay, uh, well, I guess we'll have to accept that bad news. And of course we were ecstatic. When the film opened on Thanksgiving weekend against the openings of Yentl 
and Amityville 3D, uh, we actually beat those two movies in the box office. I first saw the film when I was with my eighth grade class. <laughs> my, I took my entire eighth grade class to the movie theater, the local theater. I remember I sat with my cousin, who's my best friend, Kristen. She was in the movie as an extra. They came and visited me, all my cousins, my brother. Um, so Kristen sat next to me and my parents and my brother and, and my entire eighth grade class amongst the theaters were packed because it was like the local girl is making, you know, her film debut and it was a big deal in my town. I saw it in a theater with uh, my brothers and a bunch of my friends and I, I loved it. I saw all the imperfections, of course, especially in my own performance, uh, but I loved it. My parents are amazing, but I remember walking out and my older brother, I don't think they said anything. I went, hey, I worked on this movie, mom, dad, take a look at it. They were horrified. I, my father thought it was just horrendous, terribly tasteless, and, and really perverted. The first time I saw the movie was in New York. When we got into the theater, it was jam-packed. It seemed like everyone was really enjoying it. There were so many people asking for autographs and cameras uh, really being shot, and it, it was crazy. It was really, like, exciting. It was a real horror film. There was a lot of blood, a lot of gore, a lot of slashing. <laughs> and a lot of kids running around cursing. And I remember, like, the first moment I came on screen, I was like, oh, you know, it's a shock. It's a shock to see yourself. And then, like, to watch the whole movie, like, oh my God, oh my God, what does everybody think? And then that final shot, I was paralyzed in my chair. I was just like, oh, it's probably the first penis I'd ever seen. <laughs> that movie jumps up the screen at you. You know, I. I have a friend, Jeff, who always says, Sleepaway Camp never disappoints, <laughs> and it does it. The ending was outrageous. <laughs> but, uh, and that's what I could say about Sleepaway Camp. Yeah, I've heard a whole bunch of different theories. There's the two killer theory, which you know says Ricky and Angela are in cahoots. Not only did Peter live in the boating accident, but also Angela lived in the boating accident. So there's an Angela and a Peter. My thought has been over the years that I think Ricky knows. There's such talk about transgender, and it's such a topic that's actually first really being talked about, and gay rights and everything, and I just think it was ahead of its time. And I think that um, it was brave. Most of those kids were at an age where they were just coming to terms with what they were sexually. It's been interesting because the transgender community has embraced the film entirely, and then some people look at it as, as if it's not pro-transgender. I said, well, you know, you can each, everyone can have their own opinion. I think it's really mostly about bullying. Bullies getting their just desserts. Nobody gets killed who anybody particularly likes. That's for sure. I had to take her out of one school and put her into a different school because she was so bullied because of sleepaway camp. I mean, the story of sleepaway camp is, you know, it's just uh, about a family, a man and his wife died and he has these two little twins, Angela and Peter, and they go to a camp to sail, you know, sail, and a boat, you know, comes and crashes into them, and there's a survivor, and you're not quite sure who the survivor is, and you see eight years later is a little girl, and she's adopted into her aunt's home, her Aunt Martha and her cousin, Ricky. And Aunt Martha um, is crazy, and she thinks she's a doctor, in which case she does some un, you know, thinkable things um, and sends the kids to camp. So Angela, the child who we see eight years later and you believe is the survivor, the girl, must have mental, a mental history of, you know, some mental dysfunction or whatever you call it. How come you're so fucked up? And then I think they go to camp and see all these kids like any other camp and then there's killings and oh my gosh what happens and then it's revealed at the very end that what aunt martha did was turned the living sibling peter into a little girl for her own satisfaction of not ever having had a girl herself the end <laughs> the sequel camp two and three uh i licensed out um, I had some story ideas, but the, um, well, let's just leave it at that. I licensed them out. So I 
had spoken with Michael Simpson about the sequels, he really had his heart set on Pamela Springsteen. I know they were good friends. My manager set up the appointment for me to go and read with him. I remember I didn't click. Like she's a smart ass, you know, it's dark comedy and she has these, you know, lines and, <laughs> um, and I just didn't really connect with that Angela. So I remember I was also preparing for college. I was still acting up until, you know, my mid twenties. I did a couple after school specials. I did some soap operas. I did some commercials. I had a couple uh, big near misses with stage and film. I actually had a couple of films that were slated to go into production in the studios. And it got very frustrating and started having kids and it was time to uh, support the family. It wasn't something that was really on my radar very much. I don't remember people talking about it until, you know, Jeff Hayes finally contacted me. Through the website, we really wanted to bring Sleepaway Camp to a whole new generation and an even wider audience. Um, at that point in time, it was the late 90s, and the internet had become very popular. I mean, I wasn't even aware for a long time that people were still looking at it. I really didn't know until the internet that people um, had thought anything about this film, which was amazing to me. Basically, we figured that there couldn't possibly be a better platform to use than the World Wide Web to reintroduce Sleepaway Camp into the world. There were all these closet fans. Well, I'm a, I'm a fan of Sleepaway Camp. I'm a fan of Sleepaway Camp. Hi, my name's Phyllis and I'm a fan of Sleepaway Camp, it felt like. In early 2001, I was contacted by Fangoria Magazine and they asked me if I'd be interested in reuniting director Robert Hiltzik and star Felissa Rose on stage at their Weekend of Horrors convention. I asked Fangoria how they'd feel about me bringing in even more cast members and making an even bigger reunion out of it. And they were like, sure, you know, just let us know who you're gonna be bringing. I thought it was sort of a one-off, you know? He was talking about how oh, there's all these new fans. I didn't really believe it. Are you sure that people are gonna be interested in meeting me? I'm gonna be standing there no one's gonna know who I am. The lines were so long, we sat there for hours and hours signing autographs. I didn't expect so many people to be there. It was like, phew. there were so many people. When I was walking in, people were yelling, Ronnie, where's your red shorts? It was, it was kind of really nuts. The Sleepaway Camp reunion was really the first time that any of these cast got to see any sort of physical reception all these years later. I was so happy to meet them because they were so happy to meet me. I was, I was shocked. Now I believe. <laughs> it was just something so different than all the other slasher movies that were coming out at the time. It had a subtext all its own. And I think it was just Robert Hiltzik's off-kilter way of telling a story. Every day, it's uh, more things come up that make me realize what a, uh, what a juggernaut it is. You know, the lead actress in Rizzoli and Isles comes up, you did Sleepaway Camp? And I thought, holy crap, I'm gonna get reamed here or something. Oh, the girls and I had a party when we were in junior high and we watched that movie. That was the greatest, you know? And I thought, wow. So Robert was able to have the foresight to think about what is it in the, so far back in the deep of someone's psyche that can stand the test of time. That's so strange, so horrifying, terrifying, just to think of, that is going to, will be just as terrifying 30 years from now, 100 years from now. This is my baby. And, uh, you know, it's, it's gratifying to see that, you know, it's still in the public mind. At one time in a little bubble, we filmed this little horror movie together, and it was like one of the best moments of my life. I mean, I, they gave me a life. I know it's like this little cheesy horror movie, but it was like, you know, it was my little dream that came true and it afforded me a lot of things in life. Eyes. It comes as no surprise 
Ишне беру 